The sun was starting to dip behind the mountains when I decided it was time to head back to my cabin. Nestled deep in the heart of Yellowstone National Park, it offered the perfect escape from the chaos of city life. My name's Graham Dixon, and after a rough few years in New York, I thought living off the grid might help me find some peace. Today, though, was a little too quiet for my liking. The air felt different, heavier somehow, and it wasn't just the impending twilight. I'd been out foraging for mushrooms and herbs to add to my dinner. My knowledge of edible plants came from countless books and a bit of trial and error. There were a few close calls, but you learn quick when your life depends on it. I never thought a guy like me, who once thrived on the hustle of Wall Street, would find solace in such simplicity. Yet here I was, basket in hand, feeling like Thoreau. My closest neighbor, if you could call him that, lived about ten miles away. Joe Palovich was a reclusive type, even more than me. We exchanged pleasantries when paths crossed, which wasn't often. He was a towering man, easily over six feet, with a broad build that suggested he could handle himself. His weathered face told stories I'd never dare ask about. Joe preferred the company of nature to people, and I respected that. As I made my way back, I noticed something odd. There were footprints on the path that hadn't been there earlier. They were large, much larger than my own size elevens, and deeply embedded into the soft earth, as if the person had been running. I knelt down to examine them more closely. They were fresh, no more than an hour old. A chill ran through me, not because of the footprints themselves, but because they seemed to be following my trail from earlier in the day. Could just be Joe, I muttered to myself, though it didn't seem likely. Joe wasn't one to follow anyone, and his tracks were easy to recognize. He had a distinctive limp in his left leg from an old injury. These steps were even, powerful, and unnervingly deliberate. My cabin came into view, a modest wooden structure with a stone chimney and a wraparound porch. I quickened my pace, eager to be inside with the door locked. As I reached the porch, I saw something that made my stomach drop. The door was ajar. I was meticulous about locking it, especially after an incident last winter when a bear decided to rummage through my supplies. I pushed the door open with the tip of my boot, half expecting a raccoon or some other curious critter to scurry out. Instead, I was greeted by the disarray of my once neat living space. Chairs were overturned, drawers pulled out, and my belongings scattered everywhere. Panic started to set in, but I forced it down. I needed to stay calm and assess the situation. Who's there? I called out, my voice betraying my nerves. There was no response, only the echo of my words bouncing back from the walls. I grabbed the heavy iron poker from beside the fireplace, the closest thing I had to a weapon, and cautiously moved through the cabin. Every creak of the floorboards made my heart race faster. The intruder was gone, but they had left their mark. Papers were strewn about, my emergency radio was smashed, and worst of all, my rifle was missing. Great. Just great. I stepped back outside to look for any further signs and saw it. More footprints leading away from the cabin and into the dense woods. They were still fresh. Whoever had been here couldn't have gone far. I debated my options. Going after them seemed reckless, but staying put felt just as dangerous. I decided to follow the tracks, keeping a safe distance. The forest was eerily silent, the usual sounds of birds and rustling leaves absent, as if the wildlife sensed the tension. I moved slowly, each step measured and cautious. The tracks led me deeper into the woods than I usually ventured. I found myself in an area I was unfamiliar with, the trees growing denser, their branches interlocking like skeletal fingers overhead. I saw him before he saw me. He was a hulking figure, crouched down near a stream, fiddling with something in his hands. He was dressed in ragged clothes, his back to me, and seemed completely absorbed in whatever he was doing. I stayed hidden behind a tree, trying to get a better look without revealing myself. Then I saw it. My rifle, leaning against a nearby rock within his reach. I had to get it back, but how? Approaching him directly was too risky. 
He had a massive build, muscular and imposing. His face, when he finally turned, was marked with scars and a look of fierce determination. This wasn't someone you reasoned with. This was someone you survived. A plan began to form in my mind. I picked up a rock, weighed it in my hand, and hurled it towards the stream about twenty feet from where he was. The sound of the splash made him snap to attention, his eyes darting towards the noise. For a moment I thought he would ignore it, but then he stood up, taking my rifle with him, and moved cautiously towards the water. This was my chance. I slipped around to the other side, keeping low and moving quickly. As he inspected the stream, I closed the distance to where he had been sitting. My heart pounded in my chest, my breath shallow and rapid. I grabbed the rifle, my fingers gripping the cold metal tightly. But before I could retreat, a branch snapped under my foot. He turned, his eyes locking onto mine. For a second we were both frozen, a silent acknowledgement of the life and death stakes. He lunged at me, but I managed to bring the rifle up just in time, swinging it with all my strength. The butt of the rifle connected with his temple, and he staggered back, stunned but not down. He regained his footing faster than I anticipated and came at me again. This time I aimed the rifle properly and pulled the trigger. The shot rang out, echoing through the forest, and he fell to the ground, clutching his shoulder where the bullet had hit. He was still alive, but incapacitated. I didn't wait to see if he would get up again. I turned and ran, not stopping until I reached the safety of my cabin. I locked the door behind me, every muscle in my body trembling with adrenaline and fear. The man's blood was on my hands, literally, as I realized I'd smeared some on the rifle. I took a deep breath, trying to steady myself. I needed to think clearly. This wasn't over. I had no idea who this guy was or why he'd targeted me. The only thing I knew for sure was that he wasn't working alone. The precision of the break-in, the calculated way he followed me, it all pointed to something bigger than a random act of violence. As night fell, I fortified the cabin as best I could, barricading the door and windows. Sleep was out of the question, so I sat in the dark, the rifle by my side, listening for any sign of movement outside. Hours passed, each one stretching longer than the last. My mind raced with possibilities, trying to piece together the motives behind the attack. Then I heard it, a faint rustling outside, followed by a muffled thump. I peered through a crack in the window and saw another figure, creeping towards the cabin. This one was smaller, more agile, but no less dangerous. He carried a knife, its blade glinting in the moonlight. I couldn't afford to wait this time. I positioned myself by the door, ready to defend my home. As he approached, I could see his face clearly, a young man, no older than twenty, with a look of fierce determination. He reached for the doorknob and I swung the door open, catching him off guard. Before he could react, I knocked the knife from his hand and wrestled him to the ground. Who sent you? I demanded, pressing the barrel of the rifle to his chest. He glared at me, defiance in his eyes. You're a dead man, he spat, struggling against my grip. Not today. I replied, tightening my hold. Talk. He hesitated. Then something in his expression shifted. You've got no idea what you're up against, he said, a sinister smile creeping across his face. Enlighten me, I said. But before he could answer, there was a commotion outside. The first man, the one I'd shot, had managed to get back on his feet. He was leaning against a tree, his face twisted in pain and rage. He shouted something in a language I didn't understand, and the young man beneath me responded in kind. This wasn't just a random attack. It was coordinated. But why? What did they want from me? My mind raced with possibilities, none of them comforting. I needed answers, and I needed them now. With the young man subdued, I dragged him inside and tied him to a chair. You're going to tell me everything, I said, my voice low and menacing. Or you'll end up like your friend out there. He looked at me with a mixture of fear and defiance. You don't scare me, he said, but his voice wavered. 
Who are you working for? I asked again, this time with more force. He hesitated, then finally spoke. We were sent by someone who wants you out of the picture, he said. Someone with a lot of power and influence. Who? I demanded, my patience wearing thin. He shook his head. I don't know his name. We get our orders through intermediaries. All I know is that you've pissed off the wrong people. Great. A mysterious puppet master. Just what I needed. Outside. The first guy was trying to get up again. I couldn't let him make a full recovery, but I also couldn't just leave this one teared up here. My options were limited, and time was running out. I quickly moved to secure the cabin further, reinforcing the windows and barricading the doors. If there were more of them out there, they'd have a tough time getting in. I turned back to the young man who was watching me with a mix of curiosity and fear. Start from the beginning, I said. How did you find me? We've been tracking you for weeks, he admitted. Your trips into town, your foraging routes. It wasn't hard once we knew where to look. The guy outside? He's the tracker. I'm just the muscle. What's your mission? To take you out and recover a package. We didn't find it in your cabin, so we thought you had it with you. Package? I had no idea what he was talking about. Describe this package. He struggled against the ropes testing their strength. I don't know what it is, just that it's valuable to our employer. He's been looking for it for a long time. This was getting weirder by the minute. I had no idea what this supposed package could be. My life here was simple, and the only valuables I had were practical. Tools, food supplies, and a few personal mementos. Then it hit me. A few months ago, I'd found an old, weathered box while hiking deep in the woods. It had been buried under a pile of rocks, hidden away from prying eyes. I'd taken it back to the cabin, thinking it might be an artifact or something interesting. Inside were papers in a language I couldn't read and a small, ornate metal object that looked like a key. Was that what they were after? It seemed too far-fetched, but I had to consider every possibility. Is this what you're looking for? I asked, pulling out the box from a hidden compartment in my floorboards. His eyes widened. That's it. That's what we need. I felt a surge of anger. My peaceful existence had been shattered over a box of papers and an old key. I moved closer to him, my face inches from his. What's so important about this? I don't know, he pleaded. We're just hired hands. Our boss is the one who wants it. He's obsessed with finding whatever that key unlocks. Before I could press him further, there was a loud crash from the back of the cabin. The tracker had found another way in. I grabbed the rifle and turned to face the new threat. The young man started shouting, warning his partner. Shut up, I barked, kicking the chair to knock the wind out of him. I couldn't afford distractions. The tracker emerged from the shadows a fierce determination in his eyes despite the pain. He was holding a machete now, and his movements were slow but deliberate. I aimed the rifle at him, my finger hovering over the trigger. Don't make me do this, I warned. He grinned, a chilling expression that sent a wave of dread through me. You won't shoot, he said, advancing slowly. I pulled the trigger. The shot rang out and he staggered back, but it wasn't a fatal hit. He roared in pain and anger, charging at me with renewed fury. I barely had time to react before he was on me, the machete swinging wildly. I dodged the first strike but felt a sharp pain as the blade nicked my arm on the backswing. Desperation fueled my actions. I swung the rifle like a club, catching him across the jaw and knocking him to the ground. The machete slipped from his grasp and I kicked it away, my chest heaving with exertion. I couldn't let this continue. With one final decisive move, I brought the butt of the rifle down on his head, hard. He went limp, unconscious or worse. I didn't care to check. The immediate threat was neutralized. I turned back to the young man, who was now visibly terrified. You're going to tell me everything you know about your boss, I said, 
my voice cold. Or you'll end up like him. He swallowed hard, the defiance in his eyes replaced by fear. Okay, okay, he stammered. Our orders come from a man named Viktor Markov. He's Russian, ex-military, involved in all sorts of illegal activities, smuggling, arms dealing, you name it. He believes that Key opens a vault containing a treasure hoard hidden during the Cold War. That's all I know, I swear. Viktor Markov. The name didn't ring any bells, but the situation was becoming clearer. This wasn't just about the key or the box. It was about whatever lay hidden behind them. Something valuable enough to send men to kill for it. I needed a plan. Keeping the young man tied up, I moved to the other side of the cabin and took stock of my supplies. I had enough food and water to last a few days, but my priority was figuring out my next move. Staying here was no longer an option. I had to get rid of the evidence of the fight and prepare for a potential showdown. As I cleaned up the cabin, my mind raced. If this Markov character was as powerful as the young man claimed, then more of his goons would come looking for me. I had to stay one step ahead, but I couldn't do it alone. I needed help, someone who knew the lay of the land and could offer backup if things went south. I thought about Joe Palovich. He was a loner, sure, but he also had a reputation for being tough as nails. If anyone could help me navigate this mess, it was him. I decided to pay him a visit, despite the late hour. Don't go anywhere, I said to the young man, securing his bonds tighter. I'll be back. He glared at me but didn't say a word. I locked the cabin and made my way to Joe's place. The moonlight provided just enough illumination to navigate the forest paths without a flashlight. The silence was oppressive, broken only by the occasional rustle of leaves or snap of a twig. Joe's cabin came into view, a small, sturdy structure much like mine. I knocked on the door, hoping he'd be awake. After a few moments, the door creaked open, and Joe's imposing figure filled the doorway. Graham, he said surprise evident in his voice. What are you doing here at this hour? I need your help, I replied, quickly explaining the situation. Joe listened intently, his expression growing more serious with each word. This is bad, he said finally. If what you're saying is true, you're in deep trouble. Markov doesn't mess around. Do you know him? By reputation. He's a ruthless bastard, and if he wants that key, he'll stop at nothing to get it. What do I do? Joe sighed, rubbing his temples. We need to get rid of those bodies first. If they're found, it'll only draw more attention. Then we need to figure out a plan to deal with Markov. I nodded, grateful for his level-headedness. Together, we returned to my cabin, careful to avoid being seen or heard. The young man was still tied up and I briefly considered bringing him along, but decided against it. He was more useful here, out of the way. Joe and I worked quickly, digging a shallow grave in a secluded part of the forest. It wasn't ideal, but it would have to do. We buried the bodies, covering our tracks as best we could. By the time we finished, dawn was breaking. Back at the cabin, Joe assessed the situation. We need to get you out of here he said. Take the key in the box and disappear for a while. I have some contacts who can help you lay low. What about you? I asked. I'll be fine, he replied. I can handle myself. But you, Markov will keep coming until he gets what he wants. You need to stay off his radar. I nodded, knowing he was right. We gathered my essentials, packing them into a sturdy backpack. I took one last look at the cabin that had been my sanctuary, feeling a pang of regret. Ready? Joe asked. Yeah, I replied, slinging the backpack over my shoulder. Let's go. As we made our way through the forest, I couldn't help but think about the strange turn my life had taken. From Wall Street to the wilderness, and now on the run from a dangerous criminal. It was almost too surreal to believe but there was no time for reflection. I had to stay focused, 
stay alert. Joe led the way, guiding me through paths only he knew. We moved quickly, knowing that every moment counted. Hours passed, and we finally reached a small clearing where a battered pickup truck was parked. This will get you to the safe house, Joe said, handing me the keys. It's a long drive, but you'll be safe there. My contact will meet you and take you the rest of the way. Thank you, Joe, I said, gripping his hand. I owe you. Just stay safe, Graham, and don't look back. I nodded, climbing into the truck. As I drove away, I glanced in the rearview mirror, watching Joe fade into the distance. I didn't know what the future held, but I knew one thing for certain. I wouldn't go down without a fight. The road ahead was uncertain, fraught with danger and uncertainty, but I was ready. With the key and the box by my side, I set out on a new journey, determined to uncover the truth and protect what was mine. As the sun rose higher in the sky, I felt a renewed sense of purpose. I was no longer running away. I was running towards something, something bigger than myself, and I would face whatever came my way, head on. It was a sunny morning, and I had just finished my coffee when I decided to hike the trails in the Allegheny National Forest. I'd recently moved off the grid, finding solace in the peace and quiet that living in the forest provided. My name is Fletcher Jansen, and I guess you could say I'm a bit of a loner. My life back in the city was chaotic and draining, and I needed to escape. Out here, the only sounds were the rustling of leaves and the chirping of birds, which was a welcome change from the incessant noise of urban life. I'd packed my backpack with the essentials, water, some snacks, a map, and my trusty knife. I didn't own a gun, never saw the need for one. My knife had always been enough for any encounters with wildlife. Plus, I figured if I ever ran into trouble, the remoteness of my location would be deterrent enough for most people. The trail I chose was one I hadn't explored yet, a narrow path winding through dense trees and underbrush. It was marked on the map but rarely used, judging by the overgrowth, perfect for someone looking to avoid human contact. The air was crisp, and the scent of pine was invigorating as I set off. About an hour into my hike, I noticed the forest getting quieter. The usual sounds of nature seemed to be fading, replaced by an eerie silence. It was unsettling, but I brushed it off, attributing it to my overactive imagination. After all, living alone had its downsides, like sometimes making you see things that weren't there. I continued walking until I came across something odd, a series of deep, claw-like marks on a tree trunk. They were too large to be from any animal I knew of in the area. I felt a chill run down my spine, but shrugged it off. Maybe it was just an old bear mark or something. As I moved further, the trail became more difficult to navigate, almost as if nature itself was warning me to turn back. Stubborn as I am, I pushed forward. That's when I saw it. A clearing with what looked like an old abandoned campsite. There were remnants of a tent, a burnt-out campfire, and some scattered belongings. Curiosity got the better of me, and I started poking around. Among the debris, I found a journal. It was weathered and partially burnt, but some entries were still legible. Most of it was mundane, notes about the forest, the weather, and some sketches of the local flora. But the last few entries were disturbing. They spoke of strange noises at night, shadows moving in the trees, and a feeling of being watched. The final entry ended abruptly with, It's here. If anyone finds this, run. I felt a sense of dread creeping over me, but I told myself it was just a prank or the ramblings of someone who had spent too much time alone in the woods. Still, I decided to head back, the uneasy feeling gnawing at my gut. On my way back, I heard a rustling in the bushes. I stopped, gripping my knife tightly. Hello? I called out, trying to sound braver than I felt. No response, just more rustling. I decided to move faster, 
my senses on high alert. Then I saw it, a figure darting between the trees too fast to get a good look. It was tall, maybe seven feet, with long limbs and an unnatural gait. My heart pounded as I broke into a run. Whatever it was, it was following me, matching my speed effortlessly. I could hear it crashing through the underbrush, getting closer. Panic set in. I veered off the trail, hoping to lose it in the dense forest. The ground was uneven, making it difficult to maintain my balance. I stumbled, falling hard onto the ground, but quickly scrambled to my feet. That's when I felt a sharp pain in my leg. I looked down to see a deep gash, likely from one of those claw marks I'd seen earlier. Bleeding and terrified, I pushed on, my mind racing. I needed to find shelter, somewhere I could hide. That's when I remembered a small cave I'd seen marked on the map, not too far from my current location. I made my way there, limping and trying to stay as quiet as possible. The cave was small, just enough to crawl into, but it would have to do. I squeezed inside, pulling some branches over the entrance to conceal myself. My breathing was ragged, and I could feel the blood seeping through my makeshift bandage. The minutes felt like hours as I waited, listening intently for any sign of my pursuer. Then, I heard it. A low, guttural sound, like a growl mixed with a gurgle. It was close. Too close. I held my breath, praying it wouldn't find me. The noise circled the area, and I could hear it sniffing around. My heart pounded so loudly I was sure it could hear it. Suddenly, the sounds stopped. The forest was silent again, but this time the silence was suffocating. I stayed hidden for what felt like an eternity, too afraid to move. When I finally dared to peek out, there was no sign of the creature. I cautiously crawled out, my leg throbbing in pain. I knew I couldn't stay in the forest overnight. I had to get back to my cabin and dress my wound properly. Using my knife as a crutch, I made my way back every step a struggle. The forest seemed different now, more menacing. Every sound made me jump, and I constantly checked over my shoulder. When I finally reached my cabin, I barricaded the door and tended to my leg. The gash was deep, but I managed to clean it and wrap it tightly. Exhausted, I collapsed onto my bed, trying to process what had happened. The next morning I went to the nearest ranger station to report what I'd seen. They listened, but I could tell they didn't believe me. Missing persons weren't uncommon in the forest, but my story of a creature stalking me sounded like a campfire tale. Weeks passed, and life returned to a semblance of normalcy. But I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. One day, while chopping wood, I noticed movement in the trees again. This time, I didn't run. I stood my ground, knife in hand. The creature emerged from the shadows, revealing itself fully for the first time. It was hideous, with matted fur, elongated limbs, and a face that looked like a grotesque mask. It stared at me with its hollow eyes, as if assessing me. Then without warning it lunged. I fought with everything I had, slashing and stabbing, but it was relentless. Its claws tore into me, and I felt my strength waning. Just when I thought it was over, I managed to land a lucky strike, plunging my knife into its neck. The creature let out a horrible screech and collapsed, twitching violently before going still. Covered in blood, both mine and its, I stumbled back to the cabin. I knew I needed to get help, but first, I had to make sure it was dead. I returned to the spot, finding the creature's lifeless body. It was real. I wasn't imagining it. I called the rangers again, and this time, they took me seriously. They arrived with guns and equipment, examining the scene and taking the creature's body away. They promised to investigate further, but I knew they didn't have answers. I spent the next few days recovering, my mind trying to make sense of everything. I'd come to the forest to escape, but now I knew there were things out here far more dangerous than the chaos of city life. I decided to leave the forest and return to civilization, where the dangers were known and understood. I packed my belongings and left the cabin behind, 
carrying the scars of my encounter both physically and mentally. Sometimes life in the woods gets lonely, and I guess that's why I got a dog. But that damn dog led me to something I'll never forget. My name is Barry Hendricks, and I've lived off the grid for about ten years now, deep in the heart of the Ozark National Forest in Arkansas. I left the city because I needed space and quiet, somewhere I could breathe and not have to deal with the grind. I built myself a cabin, learned how to hunt and fish, and generally got along fine with nature. The solitude didn't bother me much, until I found Kip, an abandoned mutt, and took him in for some company. That day started like any other. Kip and I set out early in the morning to check the traps I'd laid out the previous night. The forest was thick and green, with the early sun slicing through the trees in golden beams. I enjoyed these mornings, feeling like the only man on earth, my senses sharp and attuned to every rustle and chirp. We had just checked the last trap, a good haul of rabbits for the day, when Kip started acting strange. He barked and growled at something invisible in the distance, his hackles raised. Kip was usually a calm dog, so his sudden agitation put me on edge. I strapped my hunting knife to my belt and grabbed my rifle, following him as he led me deeper into the forest. About a mile from the cabin, Kip stopped at a spot that looked like any other, but he wouldn't move. He sniffed the ground, pawed at the dirt, and whined. I knelt down to see what he'd found, pushing aside the leaves and branches. That's when I saw the bone. It was old, sun-bleached, but unmistakably human. Jesus, Kip, I muttered, unease settling in my stomach. This wasn't some animal carcass. This was a person. Curiosity got the better of me. I cleared more of the debris and found a shallow grave. There were more bones, scattered and broken, mixed with tattered, faded clothing. Whoever this was had been dead a long time. I stood up, deciding to head back and contact the authorities. Even out here, this needed to be reported. As I turned to leave, Kip took off again, barking furiously. Kip, get back here, I shouted, but he was already out of sight. I cursed under my breath and chased after him. The forest seemed denser now, the light dimmer, as if the trees were closing in around me. I found Kip at the edge of a small clearing, facing a structure I hadn't seen before. It was an old, weather-beaten shack, almost swallowed by the forest. It looked abandoned, but something about it made my skin crawl. Kip growled, his gaze fixed on the shack. I approached cautiously, my rifle at the ready. The door was ajar, hanging off its hinges. I pushed it open with the barrel of my rifle and stepped inside. The air was stale, thick with dust and decay. The interior was sparse, a rickety table, a couple of chairs, and a pile of old newspapers in one corner. Then I saw the photos. They were pinned to the walls, yellowed with age, showing different people, mostly young men and women. Some were candid shots, Others looked posed, but all of them had the same blank, terrified expressions. My stomach churned as I realized what I was looking at. A serial killer's trophy room. Suddenly, I heard a noise behind me. A soft creak of the floorboards. I spun around, rifle raised, to see a man standing there. He was tall and gaunt, with a wild look in his eyes, wearing clothes that were tattered and stained. Who the hell are you? I demanded, my voice steady despite the adrenaline pumping through me. The man smiled, a slow, chilling grin. You're trespassing, he said, his voice raspy. Back off, I warned, my finger on the trigger. He took a step forward, and that's when Kip lunged at him. The man reacted with surprising speed, pulling a knife from his belt and slashing at Kip. I fired, the shot echoing through the shack, and the man crumpled to the floor, blood pooling around him. Kip was whimpering, a deep gash on his side. I knelt down, trying to calm him, my hands trembling. I had to get him back to the cabin and patch him up, but I couldn't leave this place as it was. I took a deep breath, pulling myself together. 
I needed to find out more about this man, about what he'd done. I searched the shack quickly, finding a notebook filled with cryptic entries and more photos, some dated as far back as the 1980s. There were maps with locations marked, possibly where he'd buried other bodies. I grabbed everything I could, stuffing it into my backpack. Carrying Kip, I hurried back to the cabin, constantly looking over my shoulder. I treated his wound as best as I could, then called the sheriff's office. It took them hours to arrive, and by then the sun was setting. Sheriff Donovan was a no-nonsense type, and he listened to my story with a grim expression. His deputies secured the scene and took the man's body away. It turned out the man was a drifter, a former resident of a nearby town who disappeared years ago. The authorities had no idea he'd been living in the forest, let alone committing these horrific crimes. They found more graves over the next few weeks, matching the photos I'd found. The media had a field day with the story, dubbing him the Ozark Reaper. My quiet life was shattered by the constant stream of reporters and curious locals, all wanting to hear my tale. I avoided them as much as I could, preferring the company of the forest and Kip. One night, a few months later, I was sitting by the fire, trying to find some semblance of peace. Kip was by my side, his wound healed but the scar still visible. I thought about the man I'd killed about the lives he'd taken and the families left without answers for so long. As the fire crackled and the shadows danced, I heard a noise outside. Kip perked up but didn't bark. I grabbed my rifle and stepped out onto the porch. The night was still, the forest silent. I scanned the tree line, every muscle tensed, but saw nothing. I turned to go back inside when I heard it, a faint whisper, almost lost in the wind. You're trespassing. I froze, my heart pounding. I knew I'd killed the man, seen his body taken away. But that voice, it was unmistakable. I backed into the cabin, locking the door behind me. Kip stayed close, his eyes alert. I didn't sleep that night, my mind racing with questions and fears. Had I really killed him? Or was there someone else out there? watching me, waiting for their moment. The next morning I found footprints around the cabin leading off into the forest. They were fresh, too fresh. I knew then that my quiet life was over, that the woods I'd once found solace in now held a darkness I couldn't escape. I packed up my things, took Kip, and left the cabin. I drove until I couldn't see the forest anymore, until the memories of that place were just shadows in the rearview mirror. I don't know where I'm headed, but I know I can't go back, not with those whispers still echoing in my mind. And as for the footprints, they led me to believe one terrifying truth. The Ozark Reaper wasn't working alone. I've always enjoyed the quiet of the forest, the way the trees seem to whisper secrets to each other in the wind. So when my wife Rachel and I found an old cabin for sale deep in the main woods, we jumped at the chance. It was the kind of place where you could lose yourself in the tranquility, far from the noise of the city. Little did we know, we were stepping into a nightmare. We bought the cabin in the fall of 98. It was a bit run down, but we loved it. The nearest town was a good 30 miles away, and our only neighbor, a grizzled old man named Hank, lived a mile down the dirt road. Hank seemed friendly enough, albeit a bit eccentric. He would often drop by to share stories about the area, legends of the forest that bordered on the supernatural. You folks be careful out here, he'd say with a gravely voice that matched his rough appearance. There's things in these woods best left alone, Rachel and I would laugh it off. We thought he was just trying to spook the city folks. We were wrong. The first few weeks were idyllic. We spent our days fixing up the cabin and exploring the woods. At night, we'd sit by the fire, listening to the symphony of the forest. It was peaceful. But then, things started to change. It began with the noises. 
At first, they were subtle, twigs snapping, leaves rustling, but they grew louder and more persistent. It was as if someone or something was watching us. Rachel was the first to mention it. Do you hear that? She asked one night as we sat by the fire. Hear what? I replied, trying to sound unconcerned. That... that sound. Like footsteps. I strained my ears, and, sure enough, there it was. A faint, almost imperceptible crunching, like someone slowly creeping through the underbrush. It's probably just an animal, I said, though I didn't quite believe it myself. The noises continued for several nights. We would hear them from all directions, as if whatever it was was circling us, getting closer. Hank's warnings started to feel less like old man's tales and more like genuine concern. One evening, Hank came by, his face more serious than usual. You folks seen anything strange lately? He asked, his eyes darting around nervously. Just some noises, I replied. Probably animals. Hank shook his head. Ain't no animal I ever heard of makes sounds like that. You be careful. Lock your doors and windows at night. We took his advice, bolting the doors and drawing the curtains. But that didn't stop the feeling of being watched, of something lurking just beyond the edge of the firelight. One night, the noises stopped altogether. The silence was deafening, oppressive. Rachel and I lay in bed, straining to hear anything, even the usual sounds of the forest. But there was nothing. And then, a loud bang echoed through the cabin, like something had slammed against the wall. Rachel clutched my arm, her eyes wide with fear. What was that? I don't know, I whispered, my heart pounding. I grabbed the shotgun we kept under the bed and slowly made my way to the front door. The banging continued, rhythmic and deliberate. I threw open the door, aiming the gun into the darkness. There was nothing just the trees swaying in the wind. I stepped outside, my breath visible in the cold night air. The banging had stopped, but the feeling of being watched was stronger than ever. I circled the cabin, scanning the tree line with the flashlight. And then I saw it, a figure standing at the edge of the forest, just beyond the reach of the light. It was tall and thin, its eyes glowing faintly in the darkness. I raised the shotgun, my hands trembling. Who's there? I shouted. The figure didn't move, didn't make a sound. It just stood there, staring. I fired a warning shot into the air, but by the time the echo faded, the figure was gone. I went back inside, trying to reassure Rachel. It's nothing, I lied. Just some local kids messing around. But Rachel wasn't convinced, and neither was I. We barely slept that night, every creak of the cabin sending us into a state of high alert. The next day, we decided to visit Hank. Maybe he knew more about what was going on. As we approached his cabin, we noticed the door was ajar. I knocked, but there was no answer. Pushing the door open, we found the place in disarray. Furniture was overturned, papers scattered everywhere. And then we saw it a large pool of blood on the floor leading to the back door, which was also open. Rachel gasped, and I felt a cold chill run down my spine. Hank was nowhere to be found. We called the police, but they didn't find much either. Just the blood and some signs of a struggle. No body, no clues. Hank had simply vanished. With Hank gone, the sense of isolation grew. The noises returned, louder and more frequent. Rachel and I started to argue, the stress taking its toll. She wanted to leave, to go back to the city, but I insisted we stay. I wasn't going to be driven out of my own home by some mysterious noises. Then, one night, Rachel disappeared. I woke up to find her side of the bed empty. Her shoes were still by the door, her coat hanging on the rack. I searched the cabin calling her name, but there was no answer. Panic set in as I ran outside, shouting into the darkness. There was no trace of her. Desperate, I called the police again. They searched the area but found nothing. No footprints, no signs of a struggle. 
It was as if she had simply vanished into thin air. The officers looked at me with a mix of suspicion and pity, but they had no answers. Days turned into weeks, and still no sign of Rachel. I was alone, haunted by the memories of that night and the sense of something watching me. I started drinking, trying to drown out the fear and the guilt. I'd sit by the fire, clutching the shotgun, waiting for the noises to return. One night, as I sat in a drunken stupor, I heard a knock at the door. My heart raced as I stumbled to my feet, the shotgun slipping from my grasp. I opened the door to find Hank standing there, or at least what was left of him. His clothes were torn and dirty, his face gaunt and hollow. He looked like he hadn't eaten in weeks. They're coming, he whispered, his voice barely audible. Who's coming? I demanded, but Hank didn't answer. He just stared at me with those hollow eyes, a look of pure terror on his face. And then he collapsed, his body hitting the floor with a sickening thud. I dragged him inside and tried to revive him, but it was no use. Hank was dead. As I stood there, staring at his lifeless body, I noticed something clenched in his hand. I pried his fingers open to find a crumpled piece of paper with a single word scrawled on it. Run. The next few hours were a blur. I packed a bag, grabbed the shotgun, and fled the cabin. I didn't stop running until I reached the nearest town. The locals looked at me like I was crazy, but I didn't care. I found a payphone and called the police, telling them everything. They found Hank's body and took my statement, but they didn't seem to believe me. They chalked it up to a combination of grief and alcohol. I left Maine the next day, vowing never to return. It's been over 20 years since those events, but they still haunt me. I never found out what happened to Rachel or what Hank was so afraid of. Sometimes I still hear those noises in my dreams, and I wake up in a cold sweat, feeling the weight of unseen eyes on me. I've tried to move on, to live a normal life, but the memories are always there, lurking in the back of my mind. I can't shake the feeling that something is still out there, waiting. And every time I close my eyes, I see those glowing eyes in the darkness, and I remember Hank's final warning. Run. And so I run, from the memories, from the fear, from the unknown. But no matter how far I go, I can't escape the feeling that one day, whatever it is that haunts those woods will find me. And when it does, I don't know if I'll be able to run fast enough to escape it. I was sitting on the porch of my cabin, nursing a beer, and watching the sun dip below the trees when I first heard the scream. Living off the grid in the heart of the Rocky Mountains wasn't everyone's idea of paradise, but it suited me fine. I'd always been a bit of a loner, preferring the company of the forest to the noise of the city. My name's Emmett Walker, and I moved out here five years ago after a nasty divorce and a falling out with most of my so-called friends. This cabin a couple of miles from the nearest road, was my sanctuary. That evening the air was crisp, and the only sounds were the rustling of leaves and the occasional chirp of a bird. That scream, though, high-pitched and desperate, cut through the tranquility like a knife. It was unmistakably human, and it was close. I grabbed my flashlight and a hunting knife, the closest thing I had to a weapon, and ventured into the woods. The scream had come from the north, towards a part of the forest I rarely visited. I moved quickly but cautiously, the beam of my flashlight cutting through the darkness. I was thinking it might be a lost hiker or someone who had an accident. This area wasn't exactly known for tourism, but you'd occasionally get the odd adventurer thinking they could handle the wilderness. About twenty minutes in I found her. A young woman, probably in her twenties, was lying on the ground, clutching her leg. She had a deep gash running down her thigh, and she was losing a lot of blood. Her face was pale, her breaths shallow. Hey, it's okay. I'm here to help, I said, 
kneeling beside her. What happened? She looked at me with wide, terrified eyes. He's coming, she whispered. You have to run. He's coming. I didn't have time to ask who she meant. I heard the sound of footsteps, heavy, deliberate, and getting closer. I turned my flashlight towards the noise and saw him. A man, tall and broad-shouldered, dressed in dirty, torn clothes. His face was shadowed, but I could see a wild look in his eyes. He was carrying a hatchet, its blade gleaming in the flashlight beam. I didn't think. I acted. I lifted the woman in my arms, ignoring her scream of pain, and ran. I knew the forest better than anyone, and I hoped I could lose him in the underbrush. The man shouted behind us, a guttural yell that made my blood run cold. We stumbled through the trees, the woman's weight slowing me down. I could hear the man crashing through the forest behind us, relentless. My cabin wasn't far, and I prayed we could make it. Just as I thought we were gaining some ground, the woman's grip on me loosened. She was slipping into unconsciousness. I couldn't keep going at this pace. I needed to find a place to hide, to regroup. There was an old abandoned mine shaft nearby, a relic from the gold rush days. It was risky, but it might buy us some time. I changed direction, heading for the shaft. The entrance was concealed by overgrown bushes, and I hoped it would be enough to throw him off. We reached the mine just as the woman passed out completely. I gently laid her down and pulled the bushes back to reveal the entrance. The shaft was dark and smelled of damp earth. I carried her inside and hid us both behind a pile of old, rotting beams. I listened, straining to hear any sign of the man. For a while there was nothing. Then I heard his footsteps again, slower this time, as if he was searching. He was close, too close. I held my breath, clutching my knife, ready to defend us if he found our hiding spot. The footsteps stopped right outside the entrance. I could see his shadow cast by the moonlight filtering through the trees. He stood there for what felt like an eternity, then moved on, his footsteps fading into the distance. I waited, not daring to move or make a sound. The woman stirred beside me, groaning softly. I had to get her back to the cabin and treat her wound, but I couldn't risk moving just yet. After what felt like hours, but was probably only a few minutes, I decided it was safe. I gently shook the woman awake. We need to move, I whispered. She nodded weakly, and I helped her to her feet. We made our way back to the cabin, moving as quickly and quietly as possible. Every snap of a twig or rustle of leaves made my heart race, but we didn't encounter the man again. When we finally reached the cabin, I barricaded the door and set the woman on the couch. I found my first aid kit and did my best to clean and bandage her wound. Thank you, she murmured, her voice weak. What's your name? I asked, trying to keep her talking, to keep her conscious. Lila, she said. Lila Thompson. What happened, Lila? Who is that man? She shivered, despite the blanket I'd wrapped around her. I don't know his name. He's been hunting me. I was camping with my friends. He... He killed them. I ran. I felt a chill run down my spine. A murderer, loose in my woods. I wasn't armed well enough to take him on, but I couldn't just leave Lila here unprotected. We'll get through this, I said, trying to sound confident. In the morning, I'll get you to the nearest town. We'll get help. She nodded, but I could see the fear in her eyes. I felt it too. The night seemed endless, every creak of the cabin, every whisper of wind outside, putting me on edge. I didn't sleep. I couldn't. In the early hours of the morning, I heard it again. Footsteps outside the cabin. My heart pounded in my chest. I grabbed my knife and moved to the window, peering out into the dim light of dawn. He was there, standing just outside the tree line, watching the cabin. I knew we couldn't stay here. We had to move, to get Lila to safety. Lila, we need to go. 
Now, I said, shaking her gently. She groaned but managed to sit up. I don't think I can walk, she said, her voice barely a whisper. I looked around the cabin, my mind racing. There had to be a way. Then I remembered my old ATV parked behind the cabin. It wasn't much, but it might be our best chance. I'll carry you, I said. We're getting out of here. I lifted her again, feeling her wince in pain, and moved as quickly as I could to the back door. I peeked outside. No sign of him. I hurried to the ATV, securing Lila as best as I could and started the engine. The roar of the engine seemed deafening in the quiet morning. But I didn't care. I tore through the forest, heading for the main road. I knew he'd hear us, but I hoped the ATV would give us the speed we needed to escape. We bounced over rocks and roots, the ATV struggling but holding together. I could see the main road up ahead, a thin line cutting through the trees. Almost there. Then out of nowhere, he appeared, standing in the middle of the road, hatchet raised. I swerved, losing control of the ATV. We crashed, the vehicle flipping and throwing us both to the ground. I was dazed, my head ringing, but I forced myself to move. Lila was beside me, barely conscious. The man was coming towards us, a grim look on his face. I grabbed my knife, ready to make a stand. But just as he reached us, there was a sound. Sirens. A police car was speeding down the road towards us. The man hesitated, then turned and ran into the woods. The car screeched to a halt, and two officers jumped out. Are you all right? One of them shouted, running over. We need help, I said, my voice shaking. He's still out there. They called for backup and an ambulance for Lila. She was taken to the hospital, and I spent hours with the police telling them everything. They searched the woods but didn't find him. In the end, we were safe. The police assured me they'd keep searching, but I knew that look in their eyes. Out here, in the vastness of the forest, it was like looking for a needle in a haystack. Lila recovered and was reunited with her family. As for me, I decided it was time to leave the mountains. I packed up my things and moved back to civilization. The forest wasn't my sanctuary anymore. It was his. The first time I heard the stories about the old Pinewood cabin, I was a kid, barely old enough to grasp the concept of fear. Nestled deep in the heart of the Oregon forest, the cabin had a reputation that sent shivers down the spines of locals. They whispered tales of disappearances, strange lights, and eerie sounds emanating from the woods. It was enough to keep most people away. But not me. Fast forward a couple of decades, and I found myself standing at the edge of those very woods, my wife, Jane, by my side. We'd bought the cabin at an auction for a steal. It was a fixer-upper, but the isolation and the opportunity to escape city life were too tempting to pass up. Jane and I had been married for five years. We shared a love for adventure, often finding ourselves in places most people would avoid. The cabin was our latest thrill, a project to keep us busy and a retreat from our monotonous nine-to-five lives. Our first day at the cabin was uneventful. We unpacked, explored the surroundings, and settled in. The air was crisp, the silence only broken by the occasional call of a bird or rustle of leaves. It was perfect. But as night fell, the forest seemed to come alive with a different kind of energy. I was woken by a noise outside. It was subtle, like a branch snapping underfoot. I dismissed it as a deer or some other woodland creature and went back to sleep. The next morning we found strange markings on the trees surrounding the cabin. They looked like claw marks, but larger than any animal I knew of. Jane brushed it off, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching us. Days turned into weeks and the unease grew. We heard whispers at night, too faint to understand but too clear to ignore. Once we found our tools scattered around the yard, 
though we were sure we had put them away the night before. I started to feel like we were not alone. One evening, as we sat by the fire, Jane asked if I had seen anyone in the woods earlier. When I said no, she looked pale. She explained that she had seen a figure standing among the trees watching us. I laughed it off, trying to lighten the mood, but inside I was just as scared. The real terror began when our friend Tom came to visit. Tom was an old college buddy, always up for a good time and never one to believe in ghost stories. He arrived late in the afternoon, full of energy and excitement. We spent the evening drinking beer and reminiscing about old times. The atmosphere was light, a stark contrast to the heavy feeling that had settled over Jane and me in the past weeks. That night, the whispers returned, louder and more insistent. Jane and I lay in bed, holding each other, too afraid to move. Suddenly, we heard a blood-curdling scream from outside. We jumped out of bed and ran to the living room where Tom had been sleeping. His bed was empty, the front door wide open. We grabbed our flashlights and ran outside, calling Tom's name. The forest was dark, our lights barely piercing the inky blackness. We followed the sound of rustling leaves, our hearts pounding in our chests. Then we found him. Tom was lying on the ground, his eyes wide open, staring at the sky. His face was twisted in an expression of sheer terror. There was no sign of injury, no blood, nothing to explain what had happened. He was just... gone. We called the police, but their search turned up nothing. No signs of struggle, no footprints other than ours, no clues. They ruled it as a heart attack, but I knew better. Something in those woods had taken Tom, something that left no trace. Jane and I were shaken, but determined not to let fear drive us away. We spent the next few days trying to make sense of what had happened. I started to research the history of the area, hoping to find some explanation. What I found was a collection of old newspaper articles dating back to the 1930s. They told stories of people going missing in the woods, of strange lights and unexplained phenomena. One article mentioned a group of loggers who disappeared without a trace, their camp found abandoned, tools scattered just like ours had been. I showed the articles to Jane, and we both agreed that we needed to leave. But before we could pack up and go, the horror came to our doorstep once again. It was late afternoon, the sun casting long shadows through the trees. Jane was inside, packing our things, while I was in the yard trying to get the car started. The engine sputtered and died, refusing to turn over. As I cursed under my breath, I heard Jane scream from inside the cabin. I ran inside to find her standing in the living room, her face pale and eyes wide with fear. She pointed to the window, and when I looked, I saw him. A man stood just beyond the tree line, watching us. He was tall and gaunt, dressed in tattered clothes that looked like they hadn't been washed in years. His eyes were dark, almost black, and he had a smile that sent chills down my spine. I grabbed the shotgun we kept for protection and ran outside, yelling at the man to leave. He didn't move, just kept smiling that eerie smile. I fired a warning shot into the air, hoping to scare him off. But when the smoke cleared, he was gone. Jane and I decided to stay in the cabin that night, barricading the doors and windows. We didn't sleep, too afraid of what might come for us. As the hours dragged on, we heard footsteps outside, circling the cabin, getting closer and closer. The whispers returned, louder and more sinister than before. Just before dawn, the noises stopped. We waited for the first light of day before daring to venture outside. The forest was silent, eerily so. There were no signs of the man, but we found more claw marks on the trees, deeper and more pronounced. We decided to make a run for it, abandoning most of our belongings. The car still wouldn't start, so we took what we could carry and began the long trek back to town. The journey was harrowing, every snap of a twig or rustle of leaves making us jump. We finally made it back, exhausted and terrified. We reported everything to the police, but without any concrete evidence they couldn't do much. 
They chalked it up to overactive imaginations and the stress of Tom's death. But Jane and I knew the truth. Something in those woods was hunting us. Something that wouldn't stop until it had claimed us, too. We moved to a different state, far away from Pinewood. We never spoke of the cabin again, trying to put the whole ordeal behind us. But sometimes, in the dead of night, I hear those whispers, faint but unmistakable. And I wonder if the forest will ever let us go. Years later, I heard that the cabin burned down. No one knew how the fire started, but part of me believes it was the forest's final attempt to erase any trace of what had happened there. Tom's disappearance remained unsolved, a mystery that would haunt me for the rest of my days. The memories of that time still linger, a dark shadow over our lives. Jane and I try to live normally, but the fear never truly leaves. We avoid wooded areas, sticking to cities and open spaces. But every now and then, when the wind rustles through the trees, I catch a whisper of those voices, reminding me that some horrors can never be forgotten. Our experience at Pinewood changed us, made us more cautious, more aware of the darkness that can lurk in the most unexpected places. It's a lesson I carry with me always, a reminder that sometimes the scariest monsters are the ones that hide in plain sight, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. I never considered myself a superstitious man. Ghost stories and urban legends were things of fiction, good for a late-night scare, but nothing more. That all changed one autumn when I decided to spend a few weeks in a secluded cabin deep in the whispering woods. I needed the solitude to finish my latest novel, and a friend had offered me his family's old hunting cabin, assuring me it was the perfect place for peace and quiet. I packed my things and headed there, not knowing that the events of those weeks would haunt me forever. The drive was long, winding through narrow roads flanked by tall, dense trees. The further I drove, the more I felt a creeping sense of unease. I chalked it up to my city nerves reacting to the isolation. By the time I arrived, it was late afternoon, and the sun cast an orange glow over the wooden cabin. It was quaint with a large front porch and a chimney that spoke of cozy fires on cold nights. I unpacked quickly, eager to settle in and get to work. The inside of the cabin was rustic but comfortable, with a large stone fireplace dominating the living room and an old but functional kitchen. I set up my typewriter on the dining table, facing a large window that looked out into the forest. As night fell, I lit a fire and settled into a rhythm, typing away at my manuscript. The silence was profound, broken only by the occasional crackle of the firewood. The first night passed uneventfully, but I woke up with a strange feeling that I wasn't alone. I brushed it off as residual city paranoia. However, as the days went by, odd things started happening. I would wake up to find the front door slightly ajar, even though I was certain I had locked it. Items seemed to move on their own, and I would hear soft creaking sounds, as if someone was walking on the wooden floorboards. I tried to focus on my writing, but the sense of unease grew stronger. One evening, while I was sitting on the porch, enjoying the crisp air, I saw movement out of the corner of my eye. A figure, just a shadow, really, disappearing into the woods. My heart pounded, but I convinced myself it was a deer or some other animal. But deep down, I knew it wasn't. A week into my stay, I decided to hike deeper into the woods, hoping the fresh air would clear my mind. The forest was eerily quiet, the only sounds being my own footsteps and the occasional rustle of leaves. I came across an old abandoned cabin, much smaller and more decrepit than mine. Curiosity got the better of me, and I pushed the door open, revealing a single room with a dirt floor and broken windows. There was nothing of interest inside, but as I turned to leave, I noticed something strange on the doorframe. Deep scratch marks, as if something had tried to claw its way in or out. The discovery unsettled me, and I hurried back to my cabin, trying to shake off the feeling of being watched. That night I barely slept, 
every creak and groan of the cabin setting my nerves on edge. At around 2 a.m. I heard it, a soft, rhythmic tapping on the window. I froze, my breath caught in my throat. The tapping continued, growing louder and more insistent. Summoning all my courage, I slowly approached the window and yanked the curtain aside. Nothing. There was nothing there. I let out a shaky breath, but the relief was short-lived. From behind me I heard a whisper, barely audible but unmistakable. Leave. I spun around, heart racing, but the room was empty. Panic set in, and I grabbed my coat, deciding to drive into town and find a motel for the night. As I reached for the door, a loud bang reverberated through the cabin, like something heavy had fallen. I turned back, seeing nothing out of place. My mind raced with thoughts of what could be causing this. An intruder, an animal, or something worse. Desperate for answers, I decided to stay, to face whatever was haunting me. I spent the next day researching local legends and came across a story about a man named Elias Harper, who had lived in the area decades ago. Elias was a recluse, rumored to dabble in dark arts. He vanished one night, and his cabin, the one I had found in the woods, was said to be cursed. People spoke of strange occurrences, of hearing whispers and seeing shadows. That night, I armed myself with a flashlight and a kitchen knife, determined to confront whatever was tormenting me. As the hours ticked by, the cabin grew colder, the fire in the hearth doing little to warm the air. Around midnight, the tapping began again, but this time it was accompanied by a low, raspy breathing. I followed the sound to the living room where I saw the impossible, a figure standing by the fireplace, cloaked in shadows. Who are you? I demanded, my voice trembling. The figure didn't respond, just stood there, watching. I inched closer. The knife clutched tightly in my hand. As I approached, the figure dissolved into the darkness, leaving behind a cold, empty space. I barely slept that night, jumping at every sound. When dawn finally broke, I knew I couldn't stay another night. I packed my things, but as I was loading my car, I found a note on the windshield. It was a single word, scrawled in what looked like dirt. Run. I didn't need to be told twice. I sped down the dirt road, not daring to look back. I stopped at a diner in the nearest town, my hands still shaking as I ordered coffee. The waitress, an older woman with kind eyes, noticed my distress and asked if I was okay. I told her everything, expecting her to dismiss me as a lunatic. Instead, she nodded solemnly. You're not the first, she said. People who stay in those woods, they see things, hear things. It's best to stay away. I left the town and never returned to the whispering woods. The experience left a scar, a lingering fear that never quite went away. I never finished my novel, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something followed me, that I was never truly alone. To this day, I can't explain what happened in that cabin, but I know one thing for sure. Some stories are better left unwritten. It's funny how the biggest life lessons come from the most unexpected places. That's what I always thought, at least. For me, it was in a stretch of dense forest in the Pacific Northwest, far from the buzzing grid of city life. I used to think that living off the grid meant peace, tranquility, and a simpler existence. I learned the hard way that peace and simplicity have a price, and sometimes that price is more than you can afford. The day started like any other, with the sun peeking through the canopy of tall pines and firs, casting dappled shadows on the ground. I was busy with my usual routine, checking on my solar panels and water supply. Living out here, you learn to be self-sufficient. You can't just run to the store if you run out of something. My nearest neighbor was over ten miles away, and that's how I liked it. My name is Elwood Lawson, by the way. I guess you could say I'm a bit of a hermit, but I prefer the term self-reliant. 
Around noon, I decided to take a walk to a small clearing about a mile from my cabin. It's where I often went to gather my thoughts or just enjoy the quiet. As I made my way through the underbrush, I noticed something odd. The usual sounds of the forest were absent. No birds chirping, no rustling of small animals. It was as if the forest was holding its breath. I shrugged it off, attributing it to my overactive imagination. However, the deeper I went into the woods, the more unsettled I felt. Then I saw it. A large, dilapidated cabin that looked like it had been abandoned for decades. I had walked this path countless times before, and I was sure I had never seen this place. Curiosity got the better of me, and I approached the cabin cautiously. The door was ajar, and with a gentle push it creaked open. The inside was dark and musty, the air thick with the scent of decay. As my eyes adjusted to the dim light, I saw what looked like a bunch of old furniture and discarded belongings scattered around. There was an eerie feeling about the place, like it was frozen in time. I moved deeper into the cabin, and that's when I saw them. Pictures on the wall, covered in dust but still visible. They were of a family, a man, a woman, and two children. All of them smiling and looking happy. On a table near the pictures, there was a journal. I opened it, and the first few entries were mundane, talking about daily life and the family's move to the forest. But as I flipped through the pages, the entries became darker, more frantic. The last entry was barely legible, but I could make out a few words. Something is out there. It's watching us. We can't leave. A chill ran down my spine. I decided I had seen enough and turned to leave. That's when I heard it. A low, menacing chuckle coming from behind me. I spun around, my heart pounding in my chest. But there was no one there. I bolted out of the cabin, not stopping until I was back at my own. For the rest of the day, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I kept glancing over my shoulder, expecting to see someone, or something, lurking in the shadows. Night fell, and I locked up my cabin tight, double-checking the windows and doors. Sleep didn't come easy, and when it did, it was filled with nightmares of the family in the pictures. I woke up in a cold sweat, the first light of dawn just beginning to break. Determined to get some answers, I decided to head into the nearest town and see if anyone knew about the old cabin. It was a long hike, but I needed to know. The town was small, the kind where everyone knows everyone else's business. I went to the local diner and struck up a conversation with the owner, an elderly woman named Mabel. When I mentioned the cabin, her expression changed from friendly curiosity to something darker. You shouldn't have gone there, she said, her voice trembling slightly. That place is cursed. She went on to tell me about the family that had lived there years ago. They had moved to the forest to escape the hustle and bustle of city life, much like I had. But things went wrong. The father, a man named Henry Harlow, went mad, convinced that there was something evil in the woods. One night, he killed his entire family and then himself. The bodies were never found, and the cabin was abandoned. I felt a cold sweat break out on my forehead. The journal, the pictures, the feeling of being watched. It all made sense now. I thanked Mabel and left the diner, my mind racing. I had to get back to my cabin and get my things. I couldn't stay here, not with that cabin so close. As I made my way back, the sky darkened with storm clouds. The wind picked up, and soon rain was pouring down. I trudged through the forest my thoughts a jumble of fear and urgency. When I finally reached my cabin, I started packing my essentials, ready to leave as soon as possible. That's when I heard it again, the low, menacing chuckle. This time, it was right outside my door. I grabbed my hunting knife and cautiously approached the window. Peering out, I saw him, a tall man with wild hair and a crazed look in his eyes, standing just outside the cabin. He was drenched from the rain, but he didn't seem to care. His eyes locked onto mine, and he smiled, 
revealing teeth that looked more like fangs. I knew then that this was Henry Harlow. Somehow he had survived, or maybe it was his ghost. I didn't know and didn't care. I just needed to get out of there. I bolted for the back door, but he was faster. He crashed through the front door, wood splintering everywhere. I stumbled back, my heart hammering in my chest. He lunged at me, and I slashed at him with my knife. The blade connected and he let out a howl of pain. But he didn't stop. He grabbed my arm and twisted it, making me drop the knife. I kicked at him, trying to get free, but he was incredibly strong. In a desperate move, I grabbed a nearby chair and swung it at him with all my might. The chair shattered on impact, and Henry staggered back. I took the opportunity to run, not looking back. I could hear him behind me, crashing through the forest, but I didn't stop. I ran until my lungs burned and my legs felt like they would give out. When I finally reached the edge of the forest, I collapsed on the ground, gasping for air. I looked back, expecting to see Henry emerging from the trees, but there was nothing. The forest was silent once again. I got up and made my way to the nearest road, where I flagged down a passing car. The driver, a middle-aged man with a kind face, took one look at me and asked what happened. I told him everything, and he nodded, a grim expression on his face. You're not the first, he said, and you won't be the last. That forest has a way of taking people. I didn't say anything. What could I say? I was just glad to be alive. He drove me to the nearest town, where I got a room at a motel and tried to figure out my next move. As I lay in bed that night, I couldn't shake the feeling that Henry was still out there, watching and waiting. But I was done with the forest. I was done with living off the grid. Some places are just not meant to be inhabited. I never went back to that cabin, and I never will. The next morning, I caught a bus to the city, leaving the forest and Henry Harlow behind me. When I moved to the cabin, the last thing on my mind was danger. I was just looking for a bit of peace, a break from the noise and bustle of city life. This place, tucked away in the dense forests of Olympic National Park, was perfect secluded, quiet, and serene, or so I thought. The cabin itself was a modest one-room structure with a small kitchen, a bed, and a wood-burning stove for warmth. It was nothing fancy, but it suited me just fine. I had a decent supply of food, a stack of books, and a collection of vinyl records to keep me company. Most importantly, I had my space. The first few days were bliss, I spent my time hiking through the woods, exploring the trails, and enjoying the solitude. I even spotted a family of deer grazing near the edge of a meadow one morning. It was like a scene out of a nature documentary. But things took a turn on the fifth day. I was returning from a hike when I noticed something strange. The door to the cabin, which I had locked before leaving, was slightly ajar. My heart skipped a beat. I approached cautiously, calling out a tentative, Hello? There was no response. Inside, everything seemed normal at first glance. Nothing appeared to be missing or out of place. Still, the open door gnawed at me. I checked the windows and found them all secure. I chalked it up to my own carelessness and locked the door again, this time making sure it was firmly shut. That night I had trouble sleeping. Every creak and groan of the old cabin seemed amplified in the darkness. At one point I thought I heard footsteps outside, but when I peered through the window, there was nothing but the blackness of the forest. The next morning I decided to stay close to the cabin. I spent the day chopping wood and reading, trying to shake off the unease from the night before. In the late afternoon I heard a noise behind the cabin. It was a rustling sound like someone moving through the underbrush. Grabbing my axe, I went to investigate. As I rounded the corner, I saw him. A man, tall and gaunt, with long, greasy hair and a scraggly beard. He was rummaging through my woodpile, muttering to himself. I called out to him, Hey, what are you doing? He froze, 
his eyes wide and wild. For a moment, we just stared at each other. Then, without a word, he turned and bolted into the woods. I chased after him, but he was fast, too fast. I lost sight of him quickly and returned to the cabin, breathless and on edge. That night, I couldn't sleep at all. I sat by the window with the axe by my side, watching and waiting. Around midnight, I heard footsteps again, this time much closer. They stopped right outside the door. My heart pounded in my chest as I tightened my grip on the axe. There was a knock, soft at first, then more insistent. Who is it? I called out, my voice trembling. No answer. The knocking continued, louder and faster. I stood up, ready to confront whoever was out there. Suddenly the door burst open and the man lunged at me. He was carrying a hunting knife, its blade glinting in the moonlight. I swung the axe wildly, managing to knock the knife out of his hand. We struggled, crashing into furniture and knocking over the table. He was stronger than he looked, and he fought with a feral intensity. I managed to land a blow to his head with the flat side of the axe, dazing him. Taking advantage of the moment, I shoved him out the door and slammed it shut, locking it quickly. I could hear him outside, cursing and pounding on the door. Desperation set in as I realized how isolated I was. No phone, no neighbors, no help. I needed to get out of there. I grabbed my backpack and stuffed it with essentials. Food, water, a flashlight, and a first aid kit. The man outside was still making a racket, but I knew I couldn't stay. I went to the window, opened it as quietly as I could, and climbed out. I made my way through the woods, keeping to the shadows and moving as silently as possible. My heart raced with every snap of a twig and rustle of leaves. I knew he would come after me once he realized I was gone. After what felt like hours, I reached the edge of the forest and saw the faint glow of a distant town. Relief washed over me as I stumbled towards the lights, but it was short-lived. I heard footsteps behind me, getting closer. I turned and saw the man again, his face twisted in rage. I ran, pushing myself to the limit. My lungs burned and my legs felt like they were on fire, but I didn't stop. I could hear him gaining on me, his heavy breathing and footfalls growing louder. I burst out of the trees and onto a road. In the distance, I saw a car approaching. I waved frantically, praying they would stop. The car slowed, and the driver, a middle-aged woman, rolled down her window. Help me, please, I shouted. She looked at me, eyes wide with shock, and then at the man emerging from the woods. Get in, she yelled. I didn't need to be told twice. I jumped into the passenger seat and she floored the gas pedal, speeding away from the forest. We drove in silence for a while, the adrenaline still coursing through my veins. Finally, she spoke. What happened back there? I told her everything. The cabin, the man, the attack. She listened, her expression grim. You're lucky to be alive, she said when I finished. We reached the town, and she took me to the police station. I filed a report, but I knew it was unlikely they would find him. The forest was vast, and he knew it better than anyone. I didn't return to the cabin. I couldn't. The thought of going back there, of facing that man again, was too much. Instead, I found a small motel in town and stayed there for a few days, trying to collect myself. A week later, I received a call from the police. They had found the man. He had been living in an abandoned shack deep in the woods, surviving off whatever he could scavenge or steal. When they arrested him, they found my belongings among his things. It was over. I was safe. But the experience left a mark on me. I had sought solitude and peace in the forest, but instead I found something far more sinister. The cabin, once a refuge, was now a place of nightmares. I knew I would never return. The woman who had saved me, Donna, became a friend. We kept in touch, and she helped me through the aftermath of the ordeal. Her kindness was a stark contrast to the terror I had faced, a reminder that there was still good in the world. As for the man, he was charged and sent to prison. His motives remained unclear, 
and he never spoke a word during his trial. He was a mystery, one I was content to leave unsolved. In the end, I moved on. Life had a way of moving forward, even after the darkest of days. I found a new place to live, far from the woods, and started to rebuild. The scars of that night would always be with me. But they were just that. Scars. A reminder of a chapter I had survived and closed. I took one last look at the newspaper clipping about the trial, folded it, and put it away. It was time to focus on the future, on the life ahead of me. The forest and the cabin were behind me, and that was where they would stay. I stepped outside, took a deep breath of the crisp morning air, and smiled. Today was a new day.